All right, well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Adrian Haith as speaker for this month's Visiting Scholar Lecture. Um, Adrian did his undergraduate degree in math and computer science at Cambridge University. Uh, he went on to do his master's and doctoral degree at the University of Edinburgh in machine learning and informatics. Uh, currently, he is an associate professor in the Department of Neurology, and he is co-director of the Brain Learning Animation and Movement Lab at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Um, Adrian's research spans, uh, I think, a, a wide breadth of, of kind of the motor control and learning fields, um, and it's very highly regarded in the field. Um, but uh, specifically uh, his work on uh, habit learning and, and skill acquisition, particularly de novo skills, um, I think is, is gonna be of particular interest to those of us here at the Institute. Um, so uh, with that, um, I hope you'll extend a uh, welcome as well and I'll turn the floor over to Adrian. Okay, thanks very much, Amanda. Let me just share my screen here. Does this all look about right? You can see my screen run. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much for the introduction and and Amanda and the invitation. Um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about like one one of the questions that's been um, driving uh, us in in my lab lately, uh, and that's thinking about skill learning and habits and how these two things are related to one another. Um, so, so just kind of a little preview outline, I'm going to first talk a little bit about habits and skills and just introduce what, what I understand by these terms. Um, then, then I'll show you a couple of studies that are kind of parallel in nature, but very different tasks. But I think taking the two together, we can um, see some similarities. Uh, so let me start by just giving a little bit of an overview of habits and skills. And I'll start with this, this quote from William James. People often like to quote William James. Um, and, and he talked a lot about, about habits. Um, so here, here's a quote, which many of you may have heard before. When, when we look at living creatures from an out, outward point of view, one of the first things that strikes strike us is that they are bundles of habits. Um, and we can all kind of uh, appreciate that. And maybe it resonates with us to some extent. And we can nod along, but then when you when you actually read the rest of what William James had to say back in 1890, he offered some examples of, of habits, um, and some of his examples were walking, swimming, um, playing the piano, um, and these these are, these these are not at all nowadays things that we would regard as habits. We would regard these things as as skills. Um, so, so back in back in William James day, it seemed like there wasn't necessarily such a clear distinction between habits and skills as there is nowadays. Um, we do nowadays. We can clearly differentiate. You know, one thing is a skill. You kind of um, drinking coffee might be a habit, but making coffee well might be considered a skill. Uh, but nevertheless, there's a lot of parallels between habits and skills that uh, people find intriguing and and lead us to believe there may be some important relationship between these two things. For instance, both of the both habits and skills are acquired through experience. Uh, they're both classified as procedural memory under squire-like taxonomies. They both claim to involve the basal ganglia, and they've both been implicated with uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, and and the, the, there's a long standing ever since the, you know, that, that, that quote I showed you, many, many people have written about habits and skills, and there's really very little consensus on how these two things are related to each other. Um, so just to kind of give, a, give a, a, a flavor of just how little consensus there is, you, you know, you might, this sort of Venn diagram might illustrate the, the William James description there's not really any distinction between habits and skills at the same time other authors have written about them as though they're completely different things and in fact you can define skill as some people have argued define skill as whatever is not a habit and vice versa um, other people use language that suggests they're kind of distinct but potentially overlapping concepts 
other people still might define skill as a subset of habit and and elsewhere you can find people speaking of habits as though they're a subset of skills so just my uh, postdoc ua do really surveyed almost every single paper that's ever been written about habits and skills and found there was absolutely no consensus uh, out there on how these things are related um, so so maybe just to kind of start getting a little bit more of a handle on these things let's let's actually define what, what let me define what i understand by habits and skills so i'll start with habits because it's a little bit more straightforward uh, a habit is a be behavior that has become inflexible to changes in the goals or structure of a task uh, so it's not uh, you know some 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 uh disciplines within within you know psychology view habits as just you know life routines and things that you do repeatedly but in in neuroscience uh, in particular we've, we've converged on this definition of a habit being a behavior that you persist in doing even when it's no longer advantageous or, or beneficial so for example uh, what's been done a lot in, in the rodent literature is to look at outcome devaluation you make the outcome of your behavior no longer something that you want to do but if you still do it anyway it's a habit so for instance um, some people whenever they sit down to write they like to make coffee to uh, to drink as, as they write however if you then go and drink five cups of coffee you should be sick of coffee at that point and not want to drink any more coffee um, but if then you go and sit down and write and you're still going to make yourself more coffee, then your coffee drinking is a habit. Okay. So that's, that's okay, but it's not, it doesn't seem very related to scale. Um, another way, another type of habit that people have examined is what we call slips of action. So here's an example, which I, th I think most people at this point have experienced something along these lines. Um, let's say you want to you want to do something on your phone, maybe open an app to order some coffee, um, and you get very used to tapping the app in a particular place, uh, and then and then the icons on your screen get rearranged because you change your phone or you delete an app, and and, uh, and on, on, on iOS things get moved around that you don't want to get moved around, and then the next time you want to order coffee, you end up tapping the screen in the wrong place and and you open the wrong app. So this is this is uh, a habitual behavior of, of tapping this particular part of the screen, even though it's no longer the right thing to do, and you know it's the, not the right thing to do. Uh, but because it's because it's a behavior that's become habitual, you, you end up doing it um, despite your intentions otherwise. And so this is called a slip of action, and we think this is kind of the most likely type of habit um, to relate to skill rather than things like daily life routine and uh, like the, the coffee drinking example that I that I showed you before. Um, and then operant conditioning tasks in, in rats, there's various different subfields in, in the, in the it's a huge field, the study of habits. Um, it's by no means clear whether there's much relationship between all these different forms of habit formation. Um, so we're going to focus on this type of habit anyway, slips of action. Um, so what about skill? Um, skill is actually a surprisingly difficult thing to define. Everyone has their own sense of what skill is. Uh, not everyone agrees. Uh, a kind of a very basic definition might be something like it's an acquired capability to successfully achieve a task goal. Um, John Krakauer suggested in one paper that you know it when you see it. Um, it's, it's hard to, to come up with a definition that, that makes everyone happy. But so instead, I, I think it's more helpful to think about what are, what are sort of certain components of, of action that, that you see recurring over and over again across different tasks and different, um, uh, different subfields. So one is, one is action selection. Okay, if you're going to be a skilled soccer player, you at any one moment you've got various different actions you can select between. 
Uh, and more skilled soccer players are going to choose the right action more often than not. So that's action selection. Uh, it's not just enough, and particularly in, in motor skills, this is important. It's not just enough to select the right action. You need to execute that action with precision. So a skilled soccer player is going to be able to uh, shoot the ball with much tighter variability around where they're aiming it rather than compared to a less skilled player who, who will be all over the place. Um, so selecting the right actions, executing them well, a fairly universal aspects of motor skill. Another part which, which to us we're beginning to recognize is very, very important is also the speed at which you can select the right action. Um, so, so in this situation where, where you've got the ball, trying to decide whether to shoot or dribble, it's actually no good to just sit with your foot on the ball and ponder what the right thing to do is, because if you take too long, the defender's going to approach and, and block all your options anyway. So you need to select, not just select the right action, but you need to select it as quickly as possible. And if you're playing tennis or table tennis or something, the, the ball is just going to be past you um, in, a, in, a, in a fixed amount of time. And so you, you've got to make your mind up very quickly what action to take. So a more skilled person, this, this plot just shows kind of as a function of how much time is available, the quality of your uh, action selection. So a more skilled person is going to be able to select good quality actions in less amount of time compared to a less skilled person. So those, I, what, what in, in our lab, we consider to be the kind of three pillars of um, skill. So with that in mind, we can start to speculate a little bit about how habits might relate to skill. Um, and we think the most likely way that these things are related is um, in terms of action selection, um, which might start out as a very kind of deliberative cognitive process, weighing up your options and thinking about them, um, eventually becomes automatized and something that you, rather than calculating, it, you just retrieve from memory based on the context, what is the right action to do? So early on, when you're learning a skill, it's deliberate and cognitive. Later on, it becomes more automatic. Um, and with that automatization, uh, because it's just retrieving an answer from memory, it's kind of like looking it up in a lookup table. You can retrieve the action much more quickly than when you have to be weighing up and thinking through your various options. Um, so action selection becomes automatic with practice. You're retrieving it rather than calculating it. But that gain of being faster comes at the cost of flexibility. So it, it's hard once you've, once you've switched to this retrieval strategy, you can't any longer, uh, it's not so easy to change that uh, memory that you're retrieving. So this is, this is our sort of working hypothesis about how habits and skills may be related to one another. Um, so just to kind of summarize that, that, that uh, overview, the relationship between habits and skills has been debated for a long time, but it remains very unclear exactly how they're related. Uh, everything I've, I've shown you up to now has been mostly just theoretical, philosophical, conceptual, and most of those papers that I showed you, there's, there's no shred of empirical evidence in them. They're just a lot of them philosophers discussing how these things are related. Um, there is very, very little empirical work that has looked at skill acquisition and habit formation at the same time. So that's one thing what we've really been trying to uh, address in our lab uh, is trying to put some empirical uh, foundation on, on this on this question. Um, and so just just to um, I did what, what I presented earlier was a bit conceptual. I, let, let me just boil this down to a very simple um, question that we that we can test empirically. Um, and that is what's the relative time course of skill acquisition versus habit formation? Um, and the, there's, there's two schools of thought, which I think both seem quite reasonable at, at first blush. One is this idea that um, 
as you practice a skill, you, you, you refine the skill and you get to the point that you're skilled. And then repetition locks that skill in as a habit and kind of consolidates it. Uh, so there's, there's, there's one possible point of view. The other way that this relationship could happen is, is that maybe your skill is built on a foundation of habits. You need to have the habits um, locked in place early on, and then you elaborate those habits into skills with more practice. Um, so this is, this is a kind of simple empirical question that I think we can address and I can give you some answers. I don't know what, wh whether you all um, have, have some inclination about which of these is, seems more plausible to you, but I, 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 will, I will tell you by the end of the talk which one uh, we, we have found to be the more accurate description. Um, okay, so any, any, any questions before I move on to talking about experiments and data? Um, uh, this is John White. Yeah, I did want to ask, um, is anything that you said so far um, incorporate uh, whether you're getting feedback about the adequacy of your performance? That is, it seems to me that sometimes what, what uh, bridges the transition from skill to habit is when the skill reaches a point when it is adequate and you're no longer trying to refine the skill, you're just going to use it now. So, but that implies that you've gotten feedback saying that skill is good enough for your purposes. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that would I would I would sort of classify that on on the left school of thought. I mean, certainly for your skill to improve, you need to be getting feedback. So, I, I, what you're suggesting, I guess, is that when skill is no longer improving, then it's habitual. Well, I, I I'm suggesting that relationship. I think I'm suggesting it on the flip side when when performance feedback tells you you no longer need to improve, you transition to habit. I see. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that to me that 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 seems a reasonable proposal. Um, yeah, and I would say it's in sort of in line with the, this left hand picture. Adrian, I have a quick question and you oh. may get to this. Hi, it's Laurel. Um, the, the notion that something is a habit, um, inflexible, um, that it's inflexible and that um, implies in turn that, um, that it's something that's persistent. Um, and one of the things that, that can happen, I think with, with habits are that they, there's a resurgence of habit under circumstances when attention mm. is divided, say, mm -hmm. so you've been, you've had a certain habit to turn right at a certain stop sign your whole life, and now you've changed work locations, and most of the time you're, you get to your new location fine, but one day someone calls you and you go back to turning right again. Um, and so I guess I'm struggling a bit with the notion of sort of inflexibility and persistence as the hallmark of habit as opposed to something that's been so reinforced or so practiced that it's a dominant, it remains a dominant and easily activated representation even, even at a later time point. Yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a great, a great point, great question. Um, I think, I think one, one thing that, that's, um, that I'd like to emphasize is that there's a constant tussle between habitual and goal-directed processes happening. Um, it's probably not true that, that your behavior is either just habitual or just goal-directed. Um, uh, we it, it, In this the review that I pointed to that we just wrote, um, we, we make a case that really every behavior you have has, has a myriad of computations, you know, from high-level choices about um, where, you know, which route am I going to take to work to then low-level What's my technique for turning the steering wheel? Where's the pedals? Uh, where, you know, where, where should I be looking out uh, in my rearview mirror? So there's there's no one notion of habit. There's there's you've got lots and lots of little pieces of a hierarchical control system that could either be habitual or not or in, individually. So so it doesn't make sense to think of habit as 
your, your holistic behavior is habitual or not. It's really underlying components that are habitual. Um, and then even, even within one underlying component, you've, you can have maybe, uh, well, as, as, as I'll, I'll show with, with one of the experiments coming up, the, the, there's a fight between habitual and goal-directed processes. And the earliest responses that you have may be habitual and later they give they 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 take they are dom become dominated or replaced by goal directed responses um, i think i think it's also very possible that you know other other cues can modulate the the strength of old habits and yeah it's it's possible that a habit that you thought was extinguished can can resurge under certain circumstances um, yeah, we haven't thought about 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 that exactly. Um, yeah, good, thank you. Good point. Um, okay. Okay. So here's the first um, set of experiments that I want to show you. Um, I it was about 13 years ago now. I moved from the uh, the quadrangles and spires of, of Cambridge and, and Edinburgh, where I'd done my uh, my uh, PhD and undergrad, and I moved to to Baltimore, um, and it was, it was you know a little bit of a culture shock. Um, our Baltimore is not so different from from Philadelphia, I guess. Um, and, but one of the major challenges that I had to contend with, and anyone else who's moved uh, across the Atlantic will will be familiar with this, is the the UK keyboard layout is just not exactly the same as the, the US keyboard layout. In particular, uh, the one I struggled with was uh, the quotation mark and the, and the at uh, transposed in the UK relative to the US. And when you first move, it's a constant, constant fight to stop yourself, remember where you, know, where you need to, when you're typing an email or something, where, where the symbol actually is. Um, and in fact, I have a, a Japanese postdoc in in my lab, and occasionally I've, I've found myself trying to type MATLAB code on on her computer, and the the brackets are in the wrong place. Um, the, 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 all the keys are, are wrong. Um, and so it's an example, a kind of real world example, where we form very strong habits um, through our lives that that can take a long time to extinguish. Uh, you see, so, so so we did an experiment to sort of model this process of, of um, building a habit from the beginning, and then trying to um, see see um, at what point when you're learning a task like typing, do your responses become habitual? So the simple, it's very simple task um, that was de de devised by a postdoc of mine, Robert Hardwick. Um, so you see that there are four possible symbols. We use symbols from the Phoenician alphabet. Um, and one of these will appear on the screen and that will cue you to press uh, a particular key on the keyboard. You've got your hand poised on these particular four keys. Um, in this case, it'd be this, this symbol that looks about like an F and that might mean you have to press your index finger. Um, and people just, they, they, they learn the association very quickly. That's not really the hard part. It's not really the point of this task. Um, they, they learn in five minutes which symbol goes to which key. What we really wanted to train is how quickly can they perform this association. Um, so we had people come do this task, um, in, in this case, four days in a row. They came back in and they were just um, trying to press the key as quickly as they could after the symbol appeared on the screen. And they got, they got, they got quite significant improvements. So the first day, the average reaction time was about 600 milliseconds. And you see there's day on day improvements. And by the end, they're down to, you know, well below 500 milliseconds. So, you know, at least, at least a 100, maybe 150 millisecond improvement in their reaction times. So they're getting more skilled at doing this task. Um, the question is, does this association that they've been practicing, does it then become habitual? So to test that, we switched around the meaning of two of these symbols. So if you previously had to um, 
respond to this symbol with your index finger. Now you have to respond to it with your pinky. Um, and so we gave people plenty of time. We told them there was going to be a change and they could, under self-paced conditions, try and figure out what had changed. Um, and people actually, they took this in their stride pretty easily. Um, they, they, they could learn the new mapping in about 40 trials, um, meaning uh, that, that's how long it took them to get basically perfect performance on every trial on this mapping. Um, and compared to uh, how they learned the original mapping, it was comparable. And also compared to another group where we introduced this switch um, more or less straight away after they'd learned the original mapping. I'll, I'll show you more of that in a minute. So people didn't seem habitual just if we left them to do this under self-paced conditions, right? They, they didn't, they had no problem changing their behavior. They, they were very goal-directed. But what we suspected was that um, if we force them to respond very quickly, we might be able to reveal an underlying habit that's been masked by um, goal-directed processes that just take a little bit, uh, a little bit more time. Uh, so, so the way that we uh, probed these behaviors is we, we, we had what we call a forced response paradigm. So we had a metronome of four beeps and we trained people that they had to generate a response coincident with the fourth tone in this metronome. So it looks something like this. Okay. They've got to try and press the key exactly as this fourth beep hits. And in this trial, we show them the stimulus from the very beginning, but then on other trials, we might show them the stimulus a little bit later and it'll look like this. And then some trials we might be, make it really virtually impossible for them and just flash the stimulus up a hundred milliseconds before they have to press. And then and the idea behind the experiment is to look at, well, as a function of how much time they're allowed to prepare their movements, how accurate are they able to be? Uh, so this is here's, here's just an example of what this data looks like. There's no switch or anything in this in this data, but you see the, the, the different uh, fingers are coded by different colors, and here's the different four different stimuli. And so you see up to about 300, 400 milliseconds, it's all just a jumble. But for responses past about 400 milliseconds, they're always able to find the right key. So we can see exactly the time course of that action selection using this time response approach rather than just measuring reaction times. Uh, it's, it's, and so, so, so the way we typically analyze this data is by building what we call a speed accuracy trade-off, which is basically that line that I showed you earlier. This shows you as a function of how much time they're allowed to prepare their movement, what proportion of their responses were correct. And so for this one participant in this, uh, condition before we've played any games, switching things around, they're around about chance up to about 300 milliseconds and then their performance starts to improve and beyond 400, their perfect performance basically. So as I mentioned, we had a minimal practice group. So they trained to a criterion, which meant they had to get 20 consecutive trials correct, five for each of the four symbols. And then we did the switch. And they had no problem. It took them only yeah, about 40 trials. I think I showed you that, that data point before. And so then we can look at the speed accuracy trade-off for various different um, symbols. So first, let's look at one of the symbols that was not switched. You can see more or less like what I just showed you. Um, they're at chance level up to about 300 milliseconds. And then after that, their accuracy goes up. And by around about 600 milliseconds, they're doing just fine. Now we can look at one of the symbols that was actually switched. And this in blue, I'm going to show the probability that they press the correct key um, after, after the switch. So originally, this G key, they had to press their uh, middle finger. Now they have to press their pinky. And, and for this type of uh, key, they, they again, they actually had very little problem pressing the correct key. And then this, this orange curve shows What's the probability that they pressed the old key, the one that they originally learned goes with that symbol. And here you see actually they, they, 
at chance level, and then they just go straight down from there. So there's no habit, there's no tendency for them to go back to the thing they originally learned. Their behavior here is purely showing the new mapping they've learned, and there's no hangover from the first thing they learned. But this group only trained here for really the minimum possible to get them up to speed on that task. Um, it was not enough to have them form a habit. But now let's think about the four-day practice group. As I showed, their reaction times come down over time. They get more skilled. And then after that practice for four days, then we switch them, switch two of these keys. And as I showed before, they, they have no problem learning the new mapping. Um, but now let's look at their speed actually trade-offs. For the symbol that was not switched, they're perfectly good with that symbol. It looks much like what we saw before. But now when we see the symbols, one of the symbols that was switched, it takes them significantly longer to find the right key. And then when we look at the probability of pressing the old key, you see there's this pronounced peak in the probability around between somewhere between 300 and 600 milliseconds. So this is the signature of their habit in this task. They, they, they're habitually retrieving and, and, and executing the wrong response only within this relatively narrow time window. If you look over in, in long preparation times, they're, they're doing more or less just fine. There's maybe a small probability of them doing something wrong, but their actual habit, if you look at the right time, is much, much stronger than that. So here's, here's the evidence of, of um, the, the way to reveal habit in this type of task by forcing them to move at much shorter reaction time than they're comfortable with. So we found that four days of practice is sufficient to create the habit. And in fact, other, other experiments we've done subsequently, we can find even with one day of practice, you, you, you can sometimes get a habit. Um, but back to our question of uh, the relationship between skill and habit, we actually see, it's a little bit hard to see because these purple curves look very similar, but there is a appreciable improvement in skill between the minimal practice and the four day practice. I'll show you some slightly clearer um, evidence of that. So we didn't wanna just stop at um, four days, or I should say Rob, uh, who led this work was not content to stop at four days. He wanted to see how far we could push this. So he trained uh, a group of people for 20 days doing this task. Um, here's the learning curve for this 20 day group. Um, and so four days comes to about here. And so you see, even though it looks like they've more or less plateaued at the end of four days, there is a significant improvement over this next 16 days of training. So they do manage to shave off even more of their reaction times, get down to around about 400 milliseconds. So there is an improvement, a further improvement in skill after uh, when you practice for 20 days. Um, and you can see that. So, so what Rob did is he also measured their speed actually trade off at all these at the end of each week of learning. So you can see now this is before there's any switches or anything, there's a, there's a steady week on week improvement in their speed accuracy trade off in their ability to select the correct action as a function of allowed preparation time. Yeah, they're getting better at selecting the right action more quickly. Uh, so this 20 day group now, he switched the mapping and trains to a new criterion and these people had a little bit more trouble switching, acquiring the new mapping, uh, which may suggest that, that there was there was certainly there, uh, there was a habit. Um, and now you see here the speed actually trade off for the untrained symbols much steeper than before. So that's reflecting their better skill. And when you look at the uh, the switch symbol, they're slower to correct to select the correct response. And now they have an even more pronounced uh, chance of pressing the old key that they learned, the one they practiced for 20 days. So you see, as, as I was uh, saying to Laurel, there's this, this tussle between 
the habitual response, which is the one that dominates in, in these early uh, period of action selection. And then the goal-directed response takes over for later responses. So, so one, one thing that you may be wondering is just what is this extra, this extra height on the bump here for the 20-day group versus the uh, four-day group? Does that mean they were more habitual? Uh, we, we don't think so, actually. And we, we, we built a computational model of this, this tussle, this competition between um, habitual and goal-directed action selections, try and, try and get some traction on this. Uh, so so, so with what we imagine is happening is there's, there's a habitual action being selected um, at some random time, TA, let's call it. And the timing of that is getting faster and faster as you practice. So these kind of varying shades of red are showing improved skill at the task. Uh, whereas the, and this blue is the time that you select the correct goal-directed action. Um, and, and then you can, you can, oh, wait, we have a, what our model says is how, how does the timing of these things relate to the expression of habitual behavior in the experiment? And so you see that there's no, everything is all or nothing in terms of whether or not you're habitual, but just being more skilled leads to this higher bump in the expression of habits in the experiment. So uh, I'm not going to go into the kind of gory mathematical details of this model here, but just to say that um, the model accounts very nicely. If you assume the same strength of habit and just plug in the skill level that you observe for the 20-day, uh, uh, the, the improvement in skill that you get for 20 days, then we can reconstruct pretty well that um, additional height of the peak in that group. So. To summarize, the increased expression of the habit in that 20-day group is largely attributable to improved skill between the end of day four and the, and the end of day 20. It's not about there being a stronger habit. The habit is just as strong on day 20 as it is on day four. <clears throat> so to summarize that, that study, we found that people became more skilled over up to 20 days of practice at this task. But their behavior was habitual within four days of practice. And we didn't see any evidence that habit strength changed between four days and 20 days of practice. So it looks to us like you first become habitual relatively early in learning, and that provides a platform for skill improvement further on. Um, any, any questions about that before I move on to a different set of experiments? Um, one more, if I could. Um, so you selected a task which has pretty uh, simple stimulus properties. Yeah. Um, but uh, as far as I know, we can we can turn pretty much any task, no matter how complicated, into a habitual task with enough practice. So um, does the... Um, I guess I'm wondering, part of what happens in practice seems to be that you, you find fewer and fewer uh, perceptual stimuli that you need to, to attend to to guide your, uh, your behavior. So I'm just wondering uh, sort of how to think about that in terms of the components there that are getting chunked or, or whatever. Do those, do those appear as separate little humps at different points in the skill? in the skill map that you just showed us? Or, or how do you think about that for co those kinds of complex tasks that become habitual? Yeah, I, th I, um, I, th I, think, I think you're absolutely right that, that there's, there's a process of kind of whittling down the stimulus space. I mean, we, we deliberately chose very easy, easily discriminable stimulated because we wanted to get, you know, get the most reduced task we could. Um, we, are, we are very much interested in, in building complexity of tasks. Um, and, and uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you that you would expect, um, as, as your representation of the task gets better, you, you would expect to see skill improvements and those might be accompanied by specific types of habits. Um, so if you, if you, for instance, learn 
about some new feature of the stimulus and and that's where you start paying attention to you get a little skill improvement for that but then you also lose some flexibility yeah um that that that, that would be my my guess yeah we're, we're very much interested in that we've got we've got studies kind of uh some some underway and plans to try and examine exactly that that kind of question in the future quick methods question adrian mm -hmm. is there do you think there's something special about speeding responses which is what you chose to do here um, as opposed to loading up attention or cognition with say a secondary task which is a mm -hmm. big way that people who study habit um, and slips of action in, in a higher cognitive domains have have typically typically done it yeah it's a good good question i mean we we, we focused on this just we, we found it's a very very powerful way to do it um the, the there's very little variability across individuals i imagine those other types of interventions that you're talking about would be very variable across people so we, we, we've, we, we have been working a little bit on dual tasks. Um, it, it, they're hard to do. Um, there's a lot of variability across people, what they can handle. I think, you know, different cognitive strategies you can use in order to dual task. And some people are better at that than others. Uh, but, but from a certain point of view, you can view lim limiting reaction time as a kind of stressor. And there are, there are other stressors that, that might have a similar effect yeah yeah basically if you can if you can block goal-directed control somehow or other you'll you'll expect to see what's left is is the habitual responses right so 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 what what what, what i showed you just now is a what i would characterize as a d discrete skill um, but when we're not really interested in discrete skills, very few, few skills that, that we're truly interested in in the real world are discrete. Maybe typing is, is, is one of the few examples. Where it's, and so by discrete, I just mean there's a finite number of stimuli and a finite number of responses. Um, in, you know, in reality, we, we'd love to understand things like juggling and playing soccer or even just, just walking or reaching to pick up a cup of coffee. Um, so we're studying these types of skills. Um, this is largely what's been studied in neuroscience and psychology. It's nice, easy to analyze. Um, you can do it with imaging easily. Uh, but what we really care about is continuous skills. It's not clear at all to me whether what you find in discrete tasks is gonna translate to continuous tasks, especially when it comes to habits. If habits are about repetition of the same response, the same stimulus, in, in continuous tasks, it's not at all clear that you ever repeat exactly the same thing. So how similar do things need to be to qualify as repetition? So, so, so we wanted to, to come up with a task where we could ask a similar question about when in the course of learning a skill, does it become habitual, but in the context of a continuous skill. And so this is the kind of um, thing we have in mind um, for how, the question is how do you assay habits in a continuous task and we we saw this youtube video several years ago now and some of you may have seen it of the the backwards bicycle um so this guy destin sandlin his youtube channel is smart every day he created a bicycle where you steer uh to the left and the wheel turns to the right so it's exactly the opposite of uh, a real bicycle that you've been riding your, your whole life and it's very difficult for people to learn to ride this bicycle. And presumably the reason it's hard is because all your rapid corrections that you make every time your balance gets slightly off on the bicycle, they're all tuned to a regular bicycle and that is a habit that starts dominating. And of course it just leads you to fall off if you're riding the backwards bicycle. So, we were interested in this, but but rather than picking a task that people have been doing all their life, like riding a bike, we, we wanted to know in the course of learning a brand new skill, something you just absolutely had no idea before how to do it, how can we um, find in the course of this de novo learning, as we like to call it, 
when does that skill become habitual? Um, so we've been, we've been working with a task that, that I think fits those requirements quite nicely. So we call this the bimanual cursor control task. And in order to move the cursor, it's very simple mapping just between hand position and cursor. In order to move the cursor left and right, you have to move your, your left hand up and down. And in order to move the cursor up and down, you have to move your right hand left and right. So it's, it's that simple. And we explain it to participants when they come in. It's very easy to, to see, but people find it very, very difficult to do this task. So here's an example from someone trying this for the first time. So the, the blue dot is the cursor, the yellow circle is the target, and the, the green is their left hand and the red is their right hand, but they, they can't actually see that. So here's someone having their first go at, at doing this. <laughs> so you can kind of see that you almost see the cogs wearing in their head and it's a real struggle. And this this very typical um, of, of, of all of our participants. So even though we've explained it to them, they're still struggling almost there and then they finally stay in the target long enough and they just move somewhere else and they start all over again. Uh, but here's, here's the same participant now. Sorry, here we are. Here's, here's the same participant now, four days later. And it's just no problem at all. They're just zipping around. This, they, they've got total control over where they want the cursor to be. And in fact, it's, it's kind of hard to detect much of a difference between uh, how they move the cursor under, under this bimanual mapping versus if it's just yoked to their right hand. So this, this I think, is, is, is quite reasonable to call a skill, you know, and it's a skill they're learning from scratch. Yes, it's an, it, it leverages a lot of kind of existing coordination that they know how to do, they know how to make planar arm movements and so on. But there's a, there's a, a policy a control they need to learn from where the cursor is, where the target is, to how they need to move their hands. They, that's what they need to learn from scratch. And it seems to be very difficult. Um, so here, just to kind of give you an idea of how gradual the improvement is from day one to day four. Um, if, if we look at something like path length, it gradually improves over multiple days. Reaction times improve over days. I mean, there's various other metrics that you can look at. And we've looked at um, like responses to target jumps and so on. Everything just incrementally gets better over days. Uh, and the other nice thing about this task is we can compare to just veridical cursor that's yoked to the right hand, uh, which gives us a, a ceiling on performance, which a lot of other somewhat similar tasks like cyber glove tasks and things don't, don't have a ceiling condition, baseline condition to compare to. And so you see people get pretty close to, you know, ceiling performance on both, certainly on path length and, and reaction time. So people get quite good at this over time and it's a learning curve over multiple days. So how are we going to assess habits in this task? We'd like to know at what point does it, if, if, if at all, this behavior becomes habitual? Well, inspired by the backwards bicycle, our idea was to simply flip the X axis on this task. So whereas moving your left hand up used to send the cursor to the right, now moving your left hand up moves the cursor to the left. So very much like what we saw for the backwards bicycle. And so we expect that if people are being goal directed, they'll very quickly take this alteration of the mapping into their stride, but if, if they're being habitual, then they're going to stick with what they were doing at baseline and have to keep on correcting for it. Um, so we're going to apply a mirror reversal to the cursor on top of what they've learned already, and then assess whether they can alter their behavior. And we're asking at what point, if ever, does their, part, does their behavior become habitual when they're learning this skill? Um, so, so my Graduate student, uh, sorry, yeah, my, uh, he's, he was a graduate student now, he's a postdoc, Chris Yang, uh, led this work. So he, he, he ran three groups of participants, one that just learned the mapping for two days, one that learned it for five days, and one that learned it for 10 days. Um, and everyone 
did a combination to just to warm up this baseline mapping and, and we did as the average of the two hands. Then they learned this bimanual mapping. And then at the end, we flip the mapping um, and see how they cope with that. And just to give you an idea of, of performance for this, this set of participants, you can see baseline, which is moving the hands with the vertical cursor. They're just fine early in learning. You see they, 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 they're struggling and they kind of do this Manhattan strategy where they just resolve one axis at a time. And then over 10 days of practice, you see that the paths straighten out and they just look much better. Um, and another way you can quantify this is in terms of the, the standard deviation of their, of their the initial direction of their movements. And you see this comes down very high to begin with, but it comes down over learning and in all of these groups um, to be pretty close to baseline levels. So they're getting more skilled. Um, certainly over five days, their skill is constantly improving. And even uh, from day five to day 10, they get a little bit more skilled. Um, so what about habits? What, what would we expect habits to look like in this task? Well, when, when the target is to the left of the mirroring axis, you would expect if they're being goal-directed, they'll go straight to the target. But if they're being habitual, they're going to act as if the cursor wasn't mirrored, so they're going to go to the kind of mirror image of where the target is and then correct back. So his example of a trial that looks very goal directed and here's an example of a trial that looks very habitual. Um, and so here, here I'm plotting the behavior as a kind of heat map. So on the x axis is the actual direction of the target and on the y axis is the direction they initially moved their cursor in. So you see this kind of um, on the top is the baseline or sorry, their behavior before the flip. Um, and things lie more or less on the y equals x line, as you would expect. And the distribution gets tighter as we go from two days to five days. So that's the improving skill. And then after the flip, what you see is their behavior is kind of a mixture of goal directed, where they're doing, they are moving the cursor in the appropriate direction. It's along y equals x. But then also you see a lot of trials where they're doing exactly the opposite of that. They're moving towards the mirror imaged location of the target, which is, in other words, they're habitually using their controller that they originally practiced. Um, and in fact, the, the, there's not a really a whole lot of difference in that respect between the two-day group and the five-day group and the 10-day group. They all look very much similar in terms of the level of the habit that they're showing. Uh, Chris quantified this by fit, fitting mixture models to, to, to this behavior and, and found that, yeah, it's sure enough that there's, there's really no difference in the proportion of habitual reaches um, between these, these three groups of participants. So that, 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 that was one way that we assayed habit in this task. We did have a second way. Um, uh, largely, largely inspired by the, 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 the earlier reaction time stressing task, we're worried that just point to point reaches might not stress people enough. So we, we came up with this other paradigm where people had to continuously track a target. Um, so here's an, just an example of what that looks like. It's, it's very frenetic, it's very stressful, but people, people actually surprisingly have a lot of structure in their data that tells us they're doing pretty good job of tracking this target. Um, so I, I, I don't have time to go into details about this, but we, we worked in collaboration with Noah Cowan in the mechanical engineering department here. And he, he's been using a lot of system ID, system identification approaches to characterizing behavior. Um, so you actually, it's not a totally random trajectory, it's a very structured trajectory. That's the sum of sinusoids of different frequencies and based on some very clever analysis that uh, Noah and Chris developed, we can, just from looking at this, tra these trajectories, we can pull out the way in which participants respond to motion of the target in different directions. So what I'm showing you in this, these plots at the bottom is uh, in green, how participants respond to movement of the target to the right, 
along the x-axis and in purple how they respond to movement along the y-axis. So you see the baseline which is moving their two hands together, the, the, this is what you sort of expect good behavior to look like. Early in learning there's not very much uh, behavior, it's pretty chaotic, but as they get better you see the behavior comes more and more closely tuned to uh, more and more similar to what things look like at baseline. They're learning to move their hands in the appropriate direction uh, to, uh, to follow the target. And so now we can look at um, how that looks after the flip. And what we expect is if they're being goal directed, those green arrows will still be pointing to the right. But if they're being habitual, those green arrows are going to point to the left. And so here's what things look like um, for these participants after various different durations of training. Um, and it's a little bit hard to see because these, these, these gains are very small. Um, but but here's, a, here's an analysis that kind of controls for the length of these arrows before and after the flip. So you can see um, habitual here I mean, is if, if the arrows point into the left, this gain will be negative. And so you can see at high frequencies here, which is when the time was stressed the most, you do see these participants are all consistently habitual. Um, I think we're getting close to time. So let me just, uh, I'm almost done actually. Uh, just to show these two, these two ways of measuring habit actually agree with each other quite surprisingly well. Um, we got, we got a very strong correlation between the two of them. So they're, they're not telling us totally different things. The participants that were more habitual in one tend to be more habitual according to the other metric. So to summarize, it's just very much like for the discrete task I showed you, skill improves over long periods of practice, multiple days, multiple weeks even. Um, but still, we found evidence that behavior was habitual very early on in learning. In this case, within two days of practice, people seem to be uh, habitual and they didn't seem to get more habitual with more practice, but they did become more skilled. So just kind of in conclusion to try and bring all this together, we found across two very different tasks, a discrete arbitrary visual motor association and a continuous de novo learning cursor task, pretty consistent patterns that behavior becomes habitual relatively early on in the course of skill acquisition. Um, so going back to those initial uh, scenarios that I, that I outlined, we don't think skill is first acquired and then locked in as a habit. We, we think things look more like this, that you become habitual early on and, and that provides the foundation on which you build your skills Late as you as you continue to learn. So that's that's, that's everything. I just want to say thank you to um, people involved in this work. So UA and uh, and, and John and I wrote, wrote the review uh, of skills and habits. And so if you if you're interested in the topic, uh, we 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 talk a lot about it in that review in text. Um, Rob led the work on the the um, keyboard task. Uh, and Chris led the work on the uh, bimanual cursor control task. Thanks very much for your attention, uh, and I'm uh, happy to answer any more questions. Very nice. I, uh, John White. Oh, go ahead. I just had a quick question. I was trying to um, think back to the context that you put at the start. And first of all, very, very elegant work. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, I, I was thinking, you know, and back to the Fitz and Posner, they used to talk about speed accuracy trade-off being, you were talking of it as a as executive function where the speed is how fast mm -hmm. you respond. Fitz and Posner used to talk about changing the speed of the task itself and looking to how accuracy fails, I believe. I, I'm just wondering, and I liked yeah, how yeah. you had discrete versus continuous. I'm wondering whether this, how we might think of it at that more um, 
you know, in the, in the terms of Fitz and Posner, where, where you have motor noise and and proprioceptive noise and those sort of things in regular regular tasks. I'm not sure if you could comment. Yeah, on that. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it yeah, it's it's a little bit unfortunate that this term speed speed accuracy trade off it, it sort of ended up being used for for two two different things, right? As you say, this what well, the, well, the way I was using it today as the amount of time that you're allowed to make a decision versus the accuracy of that decision. Um, perhaps, perhaps I should call it a preparation uh, accuracy trade-off. Um, and, and, and then Fitz used it as the speed of your movement and, and the accuracy of your movement. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether this kind of concept could apply to those, those types of actions, like think, uh, yeah. you know, trying to think... operate your cell phone faster with using a if you have a glove in winter or something like that. I, I was yeah, trying to. It, so, so to get, get get right back to the beginning, I talked about. Oh, sorry. Get right the way, way back. These different components of skill, and uh, there's a speed accuracy trade-off for selection, and this is speed accuracy trade-off for execution, right? So this is Fitz and Posner, uh -huh. and this right, is what right. I've been talking about. Now, now it's not, it's not these, it's, it's not necessarily obvious that these really are different components, right? You can you can be more precise just by selecting better actions. Um, or and if your feedback control as you're moving, we know that when you move, you make corrections online. You, you initially deviate and you correct. If those corrections are a little bit faster, then you're going to have a more precise movement at the end. So it's it, it's not. It, it seems very possible to me that that we might be talking about very much one and the same thing in terms of the underlying mechanism that. That explains a speed actually trade off versus a, a for selection versus execution. At the same time, we do know this 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 muscular level signal dependent noise and that kind of thing that that can account for the sort of Fitz law like effects. Um, yeah, that's that's terrific. Thank you. Thanks for. Um, I, I'm. Uh, I must admit, I, f I don't. I find the notion that habits are established early counterintuitive, and so I'm sort of uh, pushing on that a little bit. But um, uh, it sort of brings me back to the question that I asked earlier about where where the role of sort of performance feedback, because believe it or not, I did my dissertation research about 35 years ago on automatization of a motor skill. And I used oh, yeah. more of the Laurel's uh, methodology, which was to ask people to do a tracking task with or without a concurrent um, digit span load. Oh, and, okay. and, and we looked at the, uh, the error from the center of the target to their cursor and saw that it got worse when they had a digit load. And then we had them practice this task, you know, a zillion times. And their skill improved continuously in terms of that accuracy, but the interesting uh, manipulation that that is relevant to this is that um, I manipulated the the size of the visual target. In other words, they had to keep the they had to keep the target within a uh, rectangular box that the cursor controlled, mm -hmm. and I could make mm -hmm. that box a big box or a little box. Right. But I always mm -hmm. measured the error to the center of the box. And what happened was that when people started getting their the target uh, uh, reliably within the box, then I stopped seeing deterioration in the distance from the digit load, whether that was a big box or a little box. So it, it made the very clear point that they were making some judgment that performance as indicated by in the box was sufficient and now I don't need to pay attention anymore. Um, and that did happen at very different points in time for the big box and the little box. Um, mm. So so that that produced a really different sort of res, uh, uh, result from your way of uh, sort of defining when the habit has appeared. And uh, in my case, it was need for attentional control. Yeah, no, I, 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 I would love to um, to take a closer 
look at that that work I'll, I'll i'll contact you afterwards and you can point me to it but but i'm a little i'm a little bit um uh we, we've been doing some dual tasking with with this bimanual task um and and we 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 find it very hard to find tasks that interfere with it actually um even even to taking it early in learning but we 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 started this study fully expecting that 10 days after 10 days you'd be totally automatic and you wouldn't be susceptible to dual task interference but after 2 days maybe you 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 would hmm. crumble with the dual task uh, so so we did we did um mental rotation you got to you're re reaching out from a center and you got to reach 90 degrees around from mm -hmm. uh, where the target appears and we did spatial working memory so you have to remember a sequence of five targets and we did those two in combination with each other so you have to remember five targets and rotate them all 90 degrees and not pe people had no problem with those things those two tasks interfered with each other but but they didn't really interfere with with execution of the bimanual skill. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's this this very interesting contrast to, to what you found. Um, so yeah, I'd love to look at that in more detail. Thanks. Uh, Laurel. I, I just um, the way you plotted the um, the kind of uh, schematic about habits and skills uh, show, shows habit as a flat line, you know, that it's sort of like you get a habit and then it's just there and it happens pretty early on, uh, it doesn't change. And and I just, I, I wondered whether that, is that a conceptualization of habit that is shared? Do you think, is that, a, a, do you have a basis for, for sort of declaring that their habit is of one strength, um, because intuitively habit like skill could be stronger or weaker habits. You know, like if yeah. I'm a real tobacco addict and you know, every time yeah. I walk by a bar, I'm used to drinking and smoking together, then I'm just gonna have this craving. It's a, that's different. I realize it's craving related, but you know, what determines habit strength? And, and then one of the, for example, one possible, uh, parameter that might influence it is recency. Um, so, you know, the fact that after day two or so, you've been doing this thing, you know, it's the most recent thing you've done at day two and at day three and at day four, it's always the most recent thing you've done. So I wondered if you've thought about that or indeed other factors that might yeah. determine habits. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, great, a great question. It was something we talk about a lot. It's what is habit strength? Everyone sort of throws that term around. In in in, in Rob's study with the, the the key pressing, we we tried a lot to find evidence for habit strength, and in the end, we 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 didn't find it was necessary to include a habit strength parameter in our model. Um, the the data fit just as well with habit being an all or nothing thing. Um, it, that, then that 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 may be an oversimplification. And if we got slightly more precise data, we'd be able to see habit strength changing. And in that case, that the habit strength would be something like the probability that you retrieve the habitual response instead of the goal-directed response, or or that you just skip on on that retrieval. Right, and yeah. and presumably you could have more than one conflicting habit that. Um you know like turning right and turning left if, if you that kind of show up at different times depending on different contexts and goals and but that it's not yeah yeah but it's an, it's interesting to think about what determines that strength i mean and I, it seems like recency is still on the table yeah yeah i mean i yeah so so i i i i drew these as step functions largely because we we, we don't have any any empirical traction on anything other than that, I guess, is why I've drawn it that way. Uh, we, we, we've only ever seen pretty much all or nothing, but but there may just be limitations of our experiments. That, well, you could try this enough. recency idea, you know, to- Yeah, well, well yeah, so, so, so another, another I'm, not, I'm not sure if this quite relates to recency, but another way in which habits can be stronger or weaker is they can be more difficult to extinguish. Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the experiments which I, I've been wanting to do for a long time is, sorry, 
I just try to find the right slide. I should, uh, sorry. Taking these groups and not ending the experiment here, trying to have trained them on the new mapping for a while longer and seeing how long it takes to extinguish. So we've done a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, after after four days, it, it, it can be gone in like five minutes. You can get rid of this habit. After 20 days, we had people, uh, three, three days they practiced the new mapping and the habit was still there. So is that not habit strength, a stronger habit? I th yeah, that, that, that's one respect in which yeah. a habit can be strong. So, so there's persistence of the habit, like resistance to extinction. Right. Um, there, there could be maybe sort of what's the, 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 the scope of the stimuli and the circumstances where it gets retrieved, which is, I think, maybe the sort of the recency idea falls under. Um, and then there's just the, the kind of how strongly expressed is the habit. Um, so, so I'm talking about when I say it's a step function, I guess I'm saying the strength of expression is not really different. Uh, but, but ab absolutely, I think I think we need to start um, as a field, start being more precise about what strength of habit means, because people just kind of throw that term in without much definition of it. Thanks. Adrian. Hey. Hey, um, so I had a question about the uh, second study that you ran um, with the continuous habit. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you're building a completely de novo skill, you kind of have to learn a policy, right, in order to do the task. Um, and so I'm kind of struggling with distinguishing be between the learning of the policy and whether or not that policy is then habitual. Like, what, how do you know that, um, that you're not just sort of, or yeah, how do you know that it's really a habitual thing other than, rather than that's the only option that you have available to you that you can do? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, like the, the the way that we've thought about it is kind of by analogy with 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 this task of this on the screen here, right? You, you have the minimal practice, and then you can just you can just change the mapping, and and you have no problem. I guess the the difference between that and the bimanual is you can't learn the anything like the but you can't learn the bimanual task in ten minutes. Right? You have no right. skill level to speak of. Whereas here you do have, you, you can do, you can perform the task perfectly well. You're just slow. Um, yeah, so like how much, how much movement do you get in the null space when you flip the map? The, 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 so the, the null space, really, really what people tend to do in this task, they don't always perfectly move their hand up and down or left and right. They tend to just kind of have a comfortable degree of freedom and they just move their hand along one degree of freedom. Right, but it's not always going to be perfectly aligned. Uh, so, so I, don't, I don't think the null space tells us tells us that much. Um, but I, I, I guess the fact that they're habitual is maybe related to um, could be related to how long it takes them to learn it in the first place. It's true. Now, the the, the w w one one piece of data which I Oh, hold on. Let me just pull up the, the slide here because um, I do want to point something out. Um, you, you, you do always have the option of doing nothing, right? So you can, rather than actually moving in the opposite direction, if you just move randomly, your, your gain would be zero. Right, so we're not just looking for are you different from what you were doing before the flip, but um, do you actually have a negative gain? So what they're doing is actually counterproductive, and, and the, I guess the the way we're thinking of habit is contrast to to doing nothing, right? And, and I don't have the gain for um, the early learning, but if you look, where are we? Sorry, yeah, here, here your gains are almost zero. Right. 
at high frequency. So that would be the comparison for me that establishes that you're actively habitually doing the wrong thing rather than just reverting to an early learning state. Yeah, that's Does that make some sense. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, if there are no further questions, I think we'll uh, say a big thank you to Adrian. That was really fascinating and, and excellent Thanks, presentation. Um, yeah, thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye.